request uh, people turn off their mics uh, while we're talking just because there's a little bit of background noise. Uh, I just want to acknowledge that Shushma Sharmaji is sitting now in um, uh, Gandhi's, what was Gandhi's second ashram in India, where the whole Naitalam education was developed in 1937, many years ago now. And this is a form of education which is known for those who don't know it, uh, is a life-based, work-based, value-based education. And it still seems to resonate with many people today. And as a result, the Ananiketan, which is the school of which Shushma is the principal, is uh, the school was revived in 2006 uh, to again bring forward this important form of education. And so we're really looking forward to revisiting how Shushma uh, or, or, look, or hearing from Shushma Sharmaji in terms of how this education uh, is uh, uh, affecting the lives and families, not only of the students, but those in alternative education and education beyond. Uh, the second thing I want to draw your attention to is um, Sheikh Nanawiji, uh, uh, you came from uh, uh, Syria originally, as I understand, and from a, from a religious family, from a religious background, and we're able to take um, to many countries uh, by building the Medina Institute and its various centers. Uh, you've been able to build out a form of education which has um, uh, taken its grounding in Islamic scholarship, but has been able to open itself not only to men and women, uh, not, not only to scholars, but laypersons, to understand some of the foundational principles of um, not only the Cor Quran and Hadith, but uh, the, the uh, Islamic uh, 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 religion as, uh, as, as, uh, as a whole. And, you know, it, it seems to me that when you set up your center for non peace and nonviolence, you were raising something that was so profoundly um, exciting for those of us who are not uh, from the faith. Uh, that is an ability to talk across uh, religions about peace and nonviolence and to gain a greater understanding of what is uh, Islam has to offer, uh, because we're so um, much victims of the media in seeing things in a negative light, and this provides us with the opening to understand it deeply, and uh, and from the point of view of this great tradition. Um, I also want to uh, say, uh, by way of welcoming Sharad Chandra Bersab, that uh, um, Bersab has been a, a formidable uh, influence with uh, those in India who have been thinking alternatively in education. Um, he has mentored and been colleagues with uh, many people who have allowed, who have together experimented with grassroots education, with alternative education. And Beresab has been able to not only see education from a poli policy perspective, having come from the Indian Administrative Service and, and is a policy maker, but he has been able to also bring education forward uh, to teacher educators to think differently about how to do education in his affiliation with the Azim Premji Foundation, a very um, 
important uh, educational center uh, in India. So um, I think, um, you know, we have uh, uh, on the, uh, uh, our, our uh, schedule today is to, to really begin with three rounds of questions uh, where we, first of all, want to uh, get to know each of you a little bit with a first personal question, and then to move into a second round of question, which is to understand how you are transmitting this message of your education to others, particularly others who may not agree with you, and then to come and look at some of the more macro issues. So we've developed a format of three rounds of questions, and we're hoping that uh, after these questions, we will take a small break and people will come with their questions uh, who are in the audience. As you know, the audience uh, we've welcomed as uh, an audience of teachers and students and civil society and um, many different friends of Jai Jagat. And I know that some of them would like to uh, query and uh, you on some of your uh, uh, perspectives and some of your uh, understandings. And so we'll do that in the second half of this two hour uh, presentation. So um, without further ado, uh, I would like to request our Sheikh Nanawiji to begin by looking at the question of really uh, how, how did you uh, develop this approach to education. Can you tell us a little bit about your life story, and what were the um, what were the incidences that created you to take up the uh, approach that you have to education, and how, what has been your reflective learning uh, in this education, Sheikh Nanawiji? You need to unmute your mic. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me now? Great. We can. Okay. Well, sorry, thank you so much uh, for having me. It's uh, a pleasure being uh, invited to this uh, platform and uh, great to be around uh, many thinkers and nonviolent peace activists, thinkers, scholars, teachers, uh, everyone else. Um, I guess the first question is personal. So uh, my story began uh, uh, basically uh, right at uh, September 11, 2001, after the September 11 uh, tragedy, uh, that, that violence that happened in the United States. And uh, I, was awakened. I had just graduated from medical school, and uh, I was just uh, waiting to see uh, what I'm. What am I going to do? And um, I couldn't help but see um, a post 9/11 uh, Islam faith that I belong to uh, being depicted in a way I no longer recognize. Uh, all of a sudden. Uh, self-declared experts on Islam are saying things about this faith that I have never learned, never heard of, and I quite don't get. All that made me shift because, because I was personally taught from the beginning that the uh, base, the faith, the, the, the foundation of the faith is love for all and malice towards none. So I thought there was something seriously wrong with what I'm seeing here, and that cannot be right. So I took it upon myself to um, take a bit slight detour. I still went and taught um, medical sciences for the university system of Georgia, but uh, I took a detour slightly in uh, going into religious education and uh, went eventually onto my PhD track at the University of Georgia. 
uh, in philosophy, Islamic studies. Um, and all that led me obviously to the very simple fact that uh, the faith is based on absolute nonviolence, uh, that any portrayal of it any other way is simply illegitimate, and that there is quite a lot of ignorance, not just by those who don't know the faith, but also by a small fringe of people who participate in the faith, who think or participate to the faith, who may think that uh, non-violence or violence or uh, et cetera, it may be a way that's acceptable, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Also, my, eventually my civic, my civic duty, not simply to reclaim my faith, which constitutes 1.6 billion people around the world, but also uh, to uh, actually uh, help my fellow uh, American Muslims uh, in America. And obviously then when we went beyond in Europe and in Africa, et cetera, and in Asia, uh, to uh, uh, make sure that there's no further disenfranchisement uh, by people. And by, and by some people here, I mean extremists on one hand, and obviously Islamophobes, which have both basically joined hands in the objective to alienate, demonize, and disenfranchise some people. And that obviously also led to a reaction, like I said, by a fringe minority. So all that led me to uh, invest in this, and we are... Uh, we're preparing now for the first degree program, actually, in, uh, in South Africa, Medina is in South Africa, in nonviolence and peace studies. We're calling it, obviously, the Mohammedan School here, or Medina Institute, nonviolence and peace studies program, where we're going to be offering not just workshops, but accredited an accredited bachelor's degree in that. And the lesson that I can share with everyone, uh, especially with those who are involved in teaching, whether it's religious, uh, spirituality, or anything else, is that the message that I found after so many years of going through this is to be careful from erecting walls of hate under the banner of love. Thank you. You're, you're so in time that I was shocked, you know. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, that was a, a lovely portrayal and uh, gives us a sense of uh, how this 9-11 uh, traumatized you to take such an uh, important path in your life to help all of us uh, learn to, um, learn to uh, not fall into this tremendous demonization that you speak. Uh, I'll now turn to, uh, if I can also uh, ask now uh, S.C. Berhaji uh, to speak a little bit about his life story and what brought him to this uh, notion of peace and, and education that he's so involved with today. Thank you, Jill. Uh, not, it's not proper to say good evening because people are all over. So welcome to all of you. It is, I'm very delighted to be in a panel with such wise and experienced person in different ways. And also with such great and huge audience. Uh, this personal question, uh, I, on reflection, I feel that I came to this from three different angles. Uh, first is my personal life in the childhood, where as a precocious child in the school, I found some senior boys bullying me all the time. And ever since I felt, uh, what is this? Why should they bully me? Uh, what am I doing with them? You saw. So this whole issue of violence, uh, but more importantly, I had a cousin whose father was very, I'm using the word for my own uncle, whose father was very cruel. He used to punish him, beat him mercilessly, jail him in a room, not give him food for days. And he was my 
you know, this cousin was my playmate, uh, my classmate, my friend. And I used to be so upset by that. So in a way, beginning is this abhorrence of violence. Um, but that's only not on education, that's there. Uh, when I came to education, the first part in my life in education, I was all the time trying to push education as both the education secretary and as an organization I had established called a club which, that were working innovative education in the grassroots. Through that, I was trying to push whatever education is there uh, in the country or uh, largely in the world. But gradually thinking about that, I realized, and that time, you know, main issue was bringing every child to the school, making that they must attend, uh, there must be some kind of equity, etc. But gradually I realized that that education is only for livelihood. It's not the kind of education that we all aspire for, for a good human being. So I started thinking of alternatives in education. That's the second. And the third stream that comes is my engagement with Gandhi. Uh, which get, got connected with, let's say, the value education in the education area I was talking, working in. And once I made a statement saying, there can be no value education. And probably it applies also to peace. And there was such an uproar, education secretary of the government saying there cannot be value education. Because I was trying to say, value is not th something where you can train, teach people. Value is something that comes very differently. And so that quest for how values come to children, how come values come to people, that quest is the second area. And I said, once I came to Gandhi and the present model of education, I realized that the present model of education serves the interests of the society today. It's a functional education. It's not an education for making human beings with values. And in that, I realized that Gandhi's society, his vision of society is not the liberal society that we have been used to through European lens for the last 250 years. It's a post-liberal society. It's a very different kind of society where there are values that are much more important. And there, of course, nonviolence, peace, truth, justice. And I realized that, that uh, my feeling is that there cannot be anything that can be called peace education. Because peace is a part of cluster of values. Peace cannot stand alone. And therefore, I have now been working on what I would call that kind of education, which will have the kind of society Gandhi thought of, or to which I subscribe, I, I can't really say exactly the same. So in any case, nonviolence, love, justice, truth, they are all part and they're all a conglomeration, a cluster. You cannot take out one out of them, love, all these are together, and that's how I am now with, shall I say, a kind of education where peace is integral to, embedded to uh, this whole cluster of values for a different kind of society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bear Sab. I, I found it interesting that it was out of a childhood injustice that you began to find peace, and through your work in the in Hoshangabad in the grassroots experimentation of education and uh, how it helps poor and marginalized people. And then to begin to realize that it was the values uh, that were most important and that the values are not values taught in education, but the values for a child have to be reflected in society. Uh, and uh, and uh, this has become your mission 
to uh, help to reinforce those values. Thank you very, very much for such a, a lovely presentation. Uh, we now ask Shushma uh, to talk a little bit about what is the what is your life story? How did you reach this point? Um, hello and Jai Jagat to all. Um, I spent my uh, childhood in a small village. My father was a farmer and he was very proud of growing food for himself and for the society. Actually, that was the time when, in, when our country, India, witnessed repeated droughts and people died of hunger. He spoke to us about that time later on when we were able to understand this. He was driven by Gandhian philosophy, but we hardly understood it at that time. Uh, he was intelligent enough at that time to start uh, cooperative in the, uh, with uh, farmer community. And, but I would say that he was my inspiration by and large though I didn't understand the uh, uh, complexity of his uh, uh, initiative at that time. But at college level, I was associated with youth group, uh, which was active in the field of uh, uh, on uh, social issues and environmental issues as well. And uh, we came in contact with uh, uh, Baba Amte, uh, who worked for leprosy. And he uh, organized camps for youth groups and he inspired them to work for the society, to work against social issues and also to work for environment. And he organized Bharat Jodo Yatra, Meet India March uh, in 1987. And I was one of the participants. We cycled from Kanyakumari to Kashmir, from the south end to the uh, uh, north uh, of India and uh, this was the time when I uh, witnessed terrible violence that was uh, going on in Punjab and this was also a time when uh, Narmada Dam was being built and we could see tribals and rural people who were the whole uh, the num number of villages and the villagers uh, everyone getting affected by it. Uh, villages and forest area, very good land, fertile land getting submerged. So uh, there, was a, there was a cry to understand them uh, for whom this development is being, uh, is being taken, uh, taking place. And then uh, what, what are tribals and the rural people supposed to pay for that? And what are they going to get for it? That was something which actually uh, puzzled me. And uh, I was trying to look at development paradigm more critically. Uh, that was the time when uh, I was trying to think that uh, we need to uh, all youth groups need, of course, I was a science student and I could see the interconnections at the same time, the technology that derives from science that really isn't taking the scientific uh, understanding of interconnectedness, the ecology so much into consideration and actually it, uh, uh, it's so dominating that it, uh, actually uh, exploits the whole lot of people and nature by being very, very aggressive. And that took me to Gandhi. Uh, though my father uh, was reading him, but I never understood Gandhi because that was not the age when I wanted to talk about him. But later on, I, after my education, I started working in rural areas uh, I could see discrimination in all kinds, gender, caste, religion, and everything. And uh, I, as I worked, I also started working with children. And gradually, I felt that um, when I read Gandhi, that there are systems which are very aggressive. 
and which really do not uh, take into consideration the interconnectedness of human beings with nature and with each other but at the same time if we want to overcome this uh, situation uh, there is always an option and you can say no to it by through satyagraha but it's not an easy thing coming together is in itself a very complex thing and i could see it in villages because there are multiple kind of aspirations there are hierarchies even within the most uh, down trodden people and to and to really get a critical understanding of this and to uh, understand the larger picture with this complexity and to see it through our point of view uh, and come up with some collective consensus was not a easy thing uh this took me to question education and uh, i started working in education because uh, i saw a huge potential in gandhi's uh, philosophy of education which is called nai taleem is new education because uh, this is the philosophy which helps to create new individuals aspiring for a new non violent world and it also helps to create an individual which has immense trust in democratic values uh, and empathy for others at the same time respect for all life forms and that's how i thought that my uh, further work uh, should be in education and that was the time when uh, a conference was held in in sevagram asha devi aryanaikam who had done a great deal of work naitalin along with ew aryanaikam husband uh, both of them worked so well and put immense efforts in actually uh, doing this work as gandhi uh, ji wanted it um, but it got stopped in 1974 and this was the time in 19 uh, in 2004 when people from all over the country came in sevagram and felt that the situation was so bad globally and also within the country that we need to revive naitali experiment uh let me tell you that i was not feeling strong enough to um to take up any such kind of role with uh with innate strength but at the same time i was extremely willing to go enter into this kind of experimentation and uh with my Uh, i would say uh, ill preparedness not so well prepared to take up this challenge however i wanted to do it intensely i entered into this kind of uh, experiment and we tried to revive uh, ananda niketan in 2005 since 15 years i am uh, in ananda niketan trying to do things differently thank you Thank you very much Shushma. I think you've given us such a a beautiful story coming from the village uh and really uh learning Gandhian techniques through the Knit India movement and uh, slowly moving towards education and helping to rebuild the dream of Asha Devi um and Arya Naikam uh and how uh they perceived the kind of education that was needed but that got stopped and then you were part of a a group that revived it um what uh i hope the audience and people outside india are seeing is uh really how um how this uh indian gandhian value based education still has resonance and needs discourse and interaction with other forms of education in order to make it live and and to grow and to be more robust so i hope this seminar is helping in that regard uh i'd like to turn to the second question and uh if i may um ask um uh shushma to um uh, sorry bersab to begin uh with the answer the question is 
how do you work with others that come from different perspectives? When you're doing this education work, uh, this value-based education work, how do you um, uh, convince or persuade or work with uh, those who feel, who are ve vehemently opposed to either Gandhian values or peace education generally, feeling that, as you said, the, the economy and growth and India rising to become a world power is much more important than, than to, to uh, have, uh, to value peace. What, what would be your response, Bharati? Uh, thank you very much. In fact, it's, for me, it's an extremely important question. Because by and large, what I'm trying to do is not something that is acceptable to my colleagues and most of the people in the area I work in. Uh, and therefore, it has been quite a problem negotiating with them and trying to find mutual ground. Uh, let me present it this way. Jain, Jain religion. Uh, you know, I learned of Jain religion sometime long ago. Uh, it has a, a very basic principle that I imbibed and I sort of, I try to keep on using it in my life. And that principle says, the name of the principle is uh, Anekantavad and Syatvad. Uh, let me explain very briefly what does it mean. Syatvad means don't believe that you have reached the truth. Probably you have reached the truth. To put it in the Western word, skepticism. The truth that you have found is not necessarily the truth. There can be and then next part is Anekantvad. There can be several angles from which you can see the truth. That's why it's called Anekantvad. The truth may be as one or maybe many. However, one does not know. Whatever one visualizes, whatever one considers to be the truth should not be taken as an ultimate truth. Different perspectives are possible on the same truth or on probably even the so-called truth. So this Anekantvat and Syatvat is something extremely important where you have to keep your mind open. And therefore, while after working for about 20, 25 years in education, I got very disappointed with the kind of education we have. I'm using the word formal education. When I say kind of education, the formal education. I felt that in the artificial atmosphere of the school, in the prescribed syllabi, in a certain manner, that knowledge is being going to be important. You see, the current education does not talk about values. It may give lift service to values, but its main focus is on the cumulative wisdom of the humanity being imparted in some way at the most, the progressive would say, in a constructive manner to the students. There, the scope for value, the whole system of assessment has no place for values. I kept on asking long ago, saying a truthful person getting low marks, a kind person getting low marks, is he or she given the credit that she should be? Or only marks, only grades, only knowledge of the subject is important. So in, in a way, I have been rejecting the system, but gradually I realized, but it is, as I had said earlier also, it's a system that functions for the society. Currently, the society has a particular liberal philosophy on it, where you are industrializing, where you want jobs, where you have privileges based on education. And therefore, this kind of education is serving the purpose of most of the people. 
And therefore I said, okay, okay. What should I do is think of education today, how it can be gradually moved towards the kind of different education I'm looking for. So I accept this. I try to improve this, reform this, but if improve and reform in the line in which the alternative education can be. Secondly, what Sushma said, very important. Nay Talim. One of the quests that I have these days is, is Nay Talim a very different model? It's an extremely different model, but is that going to really lead to Gandhian values? Or is it only partial? What I notice is when Gandhiji spoke about Nay Talim, so much about Nay Talim, he has been speaking and he has been progressing in, in his speech, in his own conception. It's not only formal education. I believe that unless there is education with the community, therefore, number one, can the school also practice the values it is talking about? I call it, can it become the microcosm of the society uh, where these values are permeated? Secondly, can it interact with the community and the school values currently are at odds? And therefore, in what way can you help the student, the children, not be facing a conflict of values in the school and in the community? How can you help that together, which means the community also, a community education, which Gandhi talked about towards the end of his life. Unless you have the community education, school education, all combined with values, you may not be able to reach where you wanted to. Therefore, that, that, that's how I see the connection, being able to go gradually from what exists today towards what I have in my mind. Thank you. Thank you, Beresab. Um, to highlight how uh, Nai Talam, uh, Gandhi's education, to what extent did it really create a change of values? And unless we connect with the community uh, and really make uh, life and learning closer, it's very hard to say that the Nai Talam is being successful. So I think that's uh, now over to you, Shushma Ji. Um, what, what, um, how do you deal with people who come from a different perspective when you're trying to promote Naitalam? Uh, how do you help them to understand the deeper level of, of this form of education? Uh... Let me tell you, when you uh, work with children, parents, and the neighborhood community, uh, you come across different ways of uh, uh, people uh, having different ways of looking at things. There can be people from uh, social, uh, from who feel that the world is being uh, extremely traumatic and uh, uh, discriminating and when they look at Naitali, when the whole other system is actually trying to go by meritorious way, Naitali with hands-on work, uh, what is it actually trying to do? This is a, crit a critical question that they might ask us and we should be uh, clear enough to answer this question and prove through our own work that yes, it develops critical intelligence in a child. If child is sensitized and the whole uh, and the community as well as parents uh, are able to understand the world with its complexity and to see that Naitalim is actually enabling child uh, and equipping child to deal with the world with uh, uh, the whole of its complexity in a better way. 
it's not just the intellect it's the critical understanding of the society how the things are interconnected and they uh, actually um, affect uh, each other is something which children can understand through nantali and even the parents have to understand that so such kind of intensive dialogue is very much very much essential in nantali uh, similarly uh, looking at the developmental paradigm you might see the same paradigm being followed and appreciated even by poor who are uh, already discriminated and who already are not enjoying the benefits of this system but still aspire for the same so to understand the situation scientifically with statistics with the way it's uh, the whole development a uh, model is affecting people it takes lot of time and interaction and we have to do it without fear when uh, having patience and tolerance to what people are trying to say even within the school you can find children coming up with different ideas different understanding because they come from different socio cultural background to understand them to understand people from where they come why they think like that to empathize them also not to forget what you want to say by having constant and deep dialogue with them also with the teachers and saying even in a small community of teachers group of teachers who are working working within a school you can see everything going smooth and everything actually uh, uh everybody thinking similar uh, in all areas they have uh, different ways of understanding it because they see the world through their experience because they have different levels of uh, understanding about the world because they have studied uh, to different levels the systems and that creates a very complex situation and it's just that you have to see that what the other sushma ji uh, your internet has hanged we not able to hear you and your video is also hanged uh, probably jilvan you can take it over she can join back you are on mute jilvan yeah good uh, we'll just see if she joins again um as she was in the middle of her presentation so let's come back to shushma when she's able to rejoin I I want to now ask uh, Sheikh Nanawi ji. Uh, here Bersab talked about being uh, uh, that using the Jain principles that he cited. How uh, we become self-critical of our own uh, notions of truth. but how difficult that is i think in the current situation where you want to be self critical but one is also feeling quite defensive i think um uh in uh, uh in understanding how much polarization there is against islam yeah? so i i just wanted you to speak to this dichotomy which um we face on the one hand we want to be self critical within our faith and the other hand we're feeling somewhat self defensive that if we're too critical uh um uh are the people who disagree with us may exploit that as a, as a kind of a division can you speak to um uh how you deal with uh people who don't agree with you essentially yeah um thank you for that question um i think there has to be a healthy level of constructive self constructive criticism first of all and uh, obviously 
uh, when that is uh, present and active, uh, that's a measurement of, uh, of the viability and the vitality of the faith itself. If there is a difference between what the faith says in the scripture, let's say, and the interpretations of the scriptures. And oftentimes the problem is not in the text or the scripture, but it's the malleability of the text that allows different interpretations. And that's where we, the, the only way to gather all together is to come around core values where there are no others. Uh, in that sense, as Islam teaches us, we may be different colors, different ethnicities, different background, uh, but at the end of the day, we are one. And this way we call for a common word. And common word that we all, the Quran calls it common word, and common word that we can all understand, irrespective of where we stand and irrespective of how critical we are uh, on different levels. And that common word is unconditional compassion. And now, making love, as Islam teaches us, in my view, as our true destiny, that we can never find the meaning of life without love. And that love is mixed with that unconditional compassion because compassion, unlike mercy, does not have that element of pity, but there's an element of love in it. And therefore, uh, uh, teaching and, and, and approaching everyone, regardless where they stand on this spiritual, religious, social, political sphere, that happiness is not a matter of intensity as much as it is of balance, love, and harmony. And uh, therefore, I, I found in my experience that the, one of the most important solutions that we really have to push forth is compassion-centered education, irrespective where you stand. The principle of unconditional compassion lies at the heart of all religions, ethical and spiritual traditions, uh, moral traditions, irrespective of where they, what they are, calling us always to treat all others as we wish to be treated ourselves. We need to call for unconditional compassion to be the center of education that's given to the world today. And the reason for that is very simple. Unconditional compassion impels us to work tirelessly to alleviate the suffering of our fellow creatures. In other words, if we lose the identification of the suffering of others, not just human beings, but of earth, of animals, of things that we don't call living, then we haven't just betrayed our faith system, regardless what it is, but we failed the test of our time. Unconditional compassion also impels us to dethrone ourselves from the center of the world and put another there, because at the end of the day, we are one. Unconditional compassion uh, impels us to honor the invaluable sanctity of every human being, treating everybody without exception, with absolute justice, equity, and respect. So a compassion-centered education makes it necessary for all of us in both public and private to refrain from a consistently and empathically inflicting pain in all and any ways possible, to act or speak violently out of spite, chauvinism, or self-interest, to impoverish, exploit, or deny a basic right to anything and to incite hatred by denigrating others, even so those we consider as enemies, which is ourselves anyway at the end of the day, is a denial of our common humanity. And uh, compassion-centered education that we're trying to push forward must acknowledge that we as humanity have failed largely to live compassionately with each other. And some have even increased the sum of human misery and pain and suffering in the very name of religion, science, political differences, caste system, social, uh, socioeconomic layers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Therefore, uh, I think it's it's very important to call upon all women and men, all, to restore unconditional compassion to the center of education, morality, spirituality, religion, etc. 
It has to be the center of it. And it, it's very important to return to the ancient principle that uh, any interpretation of philosophy, religion, politics that breeds violence, hatred, or disdain is illegitimate. To ensure that our youth, our young people who are growing up are given accurate and respectful information about other traditions, religions, and cultures, even when we disagree with them. Because if we can't articulate the opponent's points as well as we articulate our own, then we haven't even started. To encourage also a positive appreciation of cultural and religious diversity. Uh, the creator, if anybody who believes in the creator power, whatever people believe in, the creator of all did create us differently and we ought to celebrate that diversity. And if had he will, had the creator will to make us all the same, uh, those who believe in the creator will all omnipotent and powerful creator, believe that and that was possible, that was a possibility. Since it was not done, then we need to enjoy the wisdom of the creator and try to work that opportunity that he gave us for a better world. And finally, I think it's very important to cultivate an informed empathy with the suffering of all people again, all people and all things, and that there are really no enemies. There may be people we disagree with, and there's all obviously evil. No one is sitting and dreaming here. But if there's still empathy is extremely important. And the answer to darkness is light. The answer to hate is love. The answer to ignorance is knowledge. Thank you very much. You saw Rhea come on, which means uh, <laughs> you brought us to an abrupt end of a wonderful um, presentation. Um, this unconditional compassion, I hope we'll get to uh, deconstruct a little more with you in the question hour to really understand how do you teach that? Because as Bear Sab spoke, teaching values is very difficult because uh, children and students uh, are socialized into a way of thinking. And then how do you um, get them to de-learn their socialization that may have been very violent and not compassionate? and learn this unconditional compassion. So I hope we'll have a chance to address that in the, in the next round. Um, the next question, uh, which um, uh, I was going to um, get Shushma, I don't, um, Ria, is Shushma coming back or do we have any idea uh, she about did, her? She did come back, but I think she dropped off as well. So we're, I'm trying to connect her. Okay, so let, let us go then to um, uh, Sheikh Nanawiji on the third question, um, which is, uh, and I think this is, you know, a good segue to what you were speaking about. You know, how do you um, address the difficult issues of uh, violence and militarism and systemic oppression, you know, because we have to recognize that there's, you know, negative and positive peace, no? that we have to address these issues in order to put forward the unconditional compassion and other arguments that you were saying. Is there a way within your whether it's the courses you're now teaching on nonviolence and peace in South Africa or within the Medina Institute training itself or just generally, uh, how, how would you uh, direct learners, students uh, to address these difficult issues? How do you face them? How do you look at them? How do you then address some of these issues. Do you have anything to throw light on this? Any insights? Uh, thanks, Jill. Yeah, we, uh, we try to take the, to try to work on both tracks simultaneously, the peace and the nonviolence track, because we view them slightly different and separate. Uh, the word peace means different things to different people. To some people, it's the absence of war, and to others, it's just the habitual inner peace and calmness, and to others is living in a harmonious world. I, I always like what uh, 
uh, the Catholic monk uh, who died in the 60s, uh, Thomas Merton, uh, wrote about that. He said, uh, and, and, and uh, around the meaning, to some people, peace merely means the liberty to exploit other people without fear of retaliation or interference. To others, peace means the freedom to rob others without interruption. To still others, it means the leisure to devour the goods of the earth without being compelled to interrupt their pleasures to be those whose uh, greed is starving. And to practically everybody or most people, peace simply means the absence of any physical violence uh, that might cast sh a shadow over uh, lives devoted to satisfaction of their animal appetite for comfort and pleasure. So that's basically what uh, Martin says and I identify with a lot of that. But we look at peace and nonviolence. First of all, nonviolence has an inner an, an intellectual uh, dimension and an outer behavioral dimension as a manifestation of the inner. The intellectual dimension of nonviolence is the most important because it starts with the conviction that regardless of whether some forms of violence are morally permissible, such as in the absolute self-defense, but a higher and more perfect morality is to abjure all violence for any purpose whatsoever against anything or anyone, whatever, and by any means, whatever. So first of all, there has to be a moral ideology in a sense to which one then struggles to conform one's behavior. And uh, this is where Islam put the two concepts, peace as in the word salam, and la ikrah, non-violence, which is no coercion or non-violence. And then with non-violence, then we're, uh, we're supposed to sort of uh, embrace it on a, not, on a per more per of a personal level, person to person. And thus it's not imposed uh, as a collective policy, for example, like peace. Uh, so therefore, nonviolence is more in the hands of the activists, the intellectuals, the thinkers, the religious scholars, the spiritual figures, etc. Whereas peace is more in a group, sometimes either governments, policies, or universities, educational groups, etc. Nonviolence can take multiple forms. One of the forms of, non of nonviolence is the absorption of violence. Uh, uh, one not only strives not to inflict violence on others, but one is also prepared to suffer the violence of others in that sense. And this is different from pacifism that may avoid the infliction of violence, but that, that does not necessarily entail a proactive commitment to nonviolence and absorption of violence. Violence is one of many expressions of death making. And from a faith perspective of Islam, salam is exactly the opposite. Hence, it's life giving, life transmission, and life enhancement. So, the practice of nonviolence and especially the absorption of violence of others is uh, very difficult uh, because of uh, violent impulses and defense of our bodily integrity and uh, of our loved ones are deeply embedded in our human nature. Uh, accordingly, obviously, it's unnatural to, uh, to us to be prepared to be victimized by others, to suffer and to potentially incur uh, grievous damage or even death rather than simply to employ violence. This is a big struggle here. And therefore, many people of peaceful disposition who would gladly see peace in the world and would be prepared to function as peacemakers between contending parties but for very various reasons, the vast majority of these people do not believe in nonviolence. Uh, and that's a difference, and that's why we need to work on both. Some of these people, for example, believe in minimalization of violence or in reducing certain kinds of violence or merely in stopping wars. Uh, for instance, almost uh, all the people who have received the Nobel Peace Prize have, uh, have either defended, promoted, or even commanded violence under all sorts of conditions. I mean, examples are the uh, are, uh, Aung uh, San Suu Kyi of Burma or Myanmar, uh, Barack Obama, uh, and uh, Abiy Ahmed of uh, Ethiopia, the current prime minister. And all that, and sometimes I think we should sort of tell the Nobel Peace Prize Committee, maybe you should take a statement from people who will eventually promote wars and violence that they should be committed to some 
some kind of nonviolence rather than just peace. But that's again the difference between peace and nonviolence, because peace could be interpreted in many different ways. And this speaks to the concept of peace again, which is starkly different from the concept of nonviolence. And I think that we're we're obliged to sort of work on both and move move them both in the right direction. Therefore, then obviously, uh, 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 unconditional compassion is an integral. Uh, component of all. And when we say we work and it's not passivism, it's, it's all out activism, but again, through a, a, the mean, uh, through nonviolent legal means and through uh, or on the basis of unconditional compassion and love. I didn't realize you were such a Gandhian there, Sheikh Ninawiji. You're, <laughs> this well, is well, amazing. You know, I mean, it's, it comes from Jesus, Muhammad, yeah. and then we have obviously contemporary uh, models such as uh, the Gandhi model, which I also studied, and also the Kenyan model, Martin Luther King model. So we have many models yes. actually, and they're, they're all somehow interconnected, and this speaks to our interconnectedness. This is, uh, this is uh, interesting. I wanted to say that Gandhi never got the Nobel Peace Prize. That was uh, probably a good thing. Um, as uh, he was truly a more nonviolent uh, person. Um, thank you. Yes, yes, please, Ria, go ahead. Uh, we are observing that Sushma ji is having the trouble that we had with you initially. Of uh -huh. So that overriding thing has to be done. Uh, I see. Uh, is, uh, you can continue. She just dropped off and she joins back. I will be interrupting so that you can okay. just add her back and you can guide her to do that. Yeah, Thank okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that we lost her because this is such a rich uh, uh, presentation. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ninawiji, for uh, really um, giving us uh, a deeper sense of the difference between peace and nonviolence and how you're uh, connecting them as well. Um, Bear Seb, if I could turn to you now, how do we um, approach, um, you know, uh, with our stance on, on value-based education, as you've been speaking, how do we um, deal with, you know, violence, militarism, sexism, oppression? Um, uh, you know, we see a lot of uh, uh, human rights violations and uh, how, how, what would you say to people uh, who are trying to be good peace educators or value-based educators? Uh, how do you guide them uh, in dealing with uh, uh, what we see today? Uh, uh, could you uh, speak on that? If you could unmute, unmute, so we could hear you. We need to unmute. Yeah, yeah, very good. Uh, it's good to continue after what Sheikh Shah has presented. Uh, Nonviolence, you know, when you're talking peace, then there is nonviolence and there is love. Gandhiji always talked about love. So, unless you have the two together, peace itself is only something that is, shall I say, passive. It does not, it's not a positive concept. The concept is love. He used the word compassion, but love, empathy. Uh, what I would suggest to the, those who work in the schools and what I keep on suggesting are three or four things. Number one, it must be understood that knowledge of values is not as important as understanding why it does not exist in the real world today. So analyze the society, try to understand how much of the violence 
whether it's structural or individual, flow from the way the social order is structured today. Uh, if you recollect Gandhi's Hindu Swaraj, when he is speaking against the lawyers, when he is speaking against parliament, when he is speaking against the doctors, he is not speaking against them. He is speaking against institutionalization of something that, that is something valuable. Health is valuable. Education is valuable. Justice, where they are working, is valuable. And yet, when they have been institutionalized in a certain form, in very rigid ways, without flexibility, then those structures also, in a way, seem to be creating a kind of violence, letting boundaries uh, in what justice is. Uh, I'll take you to then Ivan Illich. Ivan Illich also talks about boundaries. He also is saying, can you equate health with hospitals? Can, we, can you equate education with schools? So, when you are dealing with values education, you must be able to explain how an idea, a service, a value, something that is required to be practiced is not something that can be institutionalized. It is something that has to be a very flexible method of getting things done. Rather than fixed boundaries. When I spoke about the school and its problems earlier, I was again trying to say how it's really in a way authoritarian and violent. You have no choice. You go to the school and in the school, there is a curriculum to be followed. There are grades to be followed. There are, you know, after all, where is the scope for the person for freedom? Where is the person to be, to be what he wants to be? I always, you know, I, I go back to the first International Commission on Education, where it says education to be, right? Peace is to be. Peace is to be peaceful with oneself, to be at peace with the society, to be at peace with the nature. And the kind of order that exists today does not let you be at peace with yourself. So when we are talking about educators, what is important for educators is to understand all this and uh, the one thing that I did not mention earlier, when we're talking about critical thinking, I keep on saying, uh, uh, okay, in English, analyzing and evaluating the society, trying to understand why certain values do not exist there. Look at the holistic picture rather than on a segmental way. Right in the beginning, if you probably to your uh, <laughs> just like I said, there cannot be peace education. Huh? Because peace cannot be seen in peace meals. It's something that is, as Sheikh Sahib rightly said, compassion, love. It's a part of a large number of things. So my suggestion has been knowledge and practice are very different. Society is coming in the way of practice. In what way can you understand and work accept these values and work for changing the society. Be clear that these are the values that you not only learn, but you imbibe. And imbibed values is what you are trying to practice. And in that, you must also have a mission of going to change the society. Unless that is being done, you are not giving complete value education. Call it police education, call it education for compassion, call it whatever. But unless 
you are able to also give that mission that what you have understood is something that is necessary to be practiced by you and to work for transforming the society towards that thank you thank you thank you very much parasab i like how you've ended on how education how peace education has to land up in social change action to be uh, to to uh, to change to better values uh, is shushma here uh, uh, she was here but dropped off again i think no yes she went uh, we are having some problems uh, we are trying to reach her we don't have a phone number if she can uh -huh. just disappear from the site we'll try to get in touch with her through the phone Okay. okay. Is she in Sevagram? She's in Sevagram. She's in Sevagram. That is right. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Connect us through the phone. Maybe uh, we can uh, give her the phone number. Yeah. Or something. Yeah. So what I suggest, since we've had a very stimulating discussion, Anandawi Ji and Barasab, um, let us take a five-minute break. We're just going to have a little bit of um, Jan Majay. Are you going to play a little music for us? Uh, yes, sure. I'll play a couple of songs. So, uh, so just the before place. that. Uh, yes. Meanwhile, yes. meanwhile, Sushma may come. Yes. Even uh, if it runs, yes. The questions can be taken by the from the audience. Yes, that's uh, right. Jilben, just regarding that, uh, Sushma ji is having some internet trouble. So I've got right. her on the phone. Uh, right. She is there on the phone, so she can speak that way. Yeah. Then, I see. Fantastic. So, um, can you hear us, Shushma ji? Yeah, I can. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Nanawi ji and Barasab, I think it's fair to uh, just have her speak on the third question so that we can okay. complete this cycle. Um, uh, I don't know how much you heard um, uh, Shushma ji of the others, but I was wondering if you could really tell us how do you approach uh, topics that come from uh, that are, are come from places uh, of discussions around violence, militarism, uh, in your systemic oppression in your teaching. Uh, how, how are you dealing with these different approaches? Um, uh, Nanawi ji talked about how, uh, I'm not sure if you heard his presentation, uh, but was very, very uh, important about how to bring people together around nonviolence and peace. And Beresab talked about the importance of values and imbibing the, uh, the values uh, and that are much larger than, you know, skills that you learn in school or, or, or uh, you know, other kinds of learnings. Uh, so uh, those were some of the comments that they made do you have some insights on this third question you want to share? Uh, yeah. Uh, as Naitali is education for life, through life, all these realities, the bad part of the world, also the violence, the militarism, and the systemic oppression through religion or racism or casteism, particularly in India, and gender inequality, which exists in each family in India, uh, these are some of the things which are part of regular uh, dialogue and discussion with children. So, Naitani is not something which is mainly to do with the nice part of life, but they have to deal with these inadequacies, the violence, and they have to read and they have to think about these things. For example, just to tell you what happened in Hathras in Uttar Pradesh just a few days back was something which was discussed with adolescents at length. And we came up to their own families, our own families. How do we see the gender inequality playing role within ourselves, within our families? And how do we deal with it? But something which is not, uh, which we don't approve of, 
in the natural system we need to look at it through our own eyes and how do we change the situation at our level and be uh, an active member in the society as well all these issues are discussed with children similarly let me tell you uh, when things are going extremely bad with farmers uh, these topics become the topics of discussion when we begin the school so in that sense the world outside comes into the discussion on the discussion forum with children with parents and we try to resolve these questions by thinking critically this happens even within the relationship that children have with each other and similarly even a teacher who can be very authoritative so in naitani teachers are not supposed to be authoritative so we work with children that is how we come on equal plane with children but at the same time the age and experience can create a kind of bias in the sense that uh, they feel they can be fearful because of the authority so our role in naitali is to ensure that children absolutely comfortable to express themselves they might be wrong they might be correct uh, there is no actually very uh, uh, clear thing is wrong and right when child is actually uh, trying to think in her own context we have to just understand and come to some understanding why the child is thinking like this when have this course dialogue and the uh, act through different situations child at individual level and children's community at the community level can come to a common understanding about discrimination about violence about their own roles and even resolving conflicts within and in the society so it's an uh, it's a continuous process of understanding self the smaller community school community and the larger community beginning from their own to the global community the national community the state community and i think it's this uh, uh this uh, gradual taking over to uh, larger complexity and understanding uh, self in connection with uh, with the community at different levels and that is how children can understand why them they can understand uh, how the system operate how uh, the operation actually uh, takes place in the uh, in the society and how what do they do what are their role and what is the role of the community so we go to the community as well Uh, so there is a small community in the school. At the same time, children go to the smaller community, which is around them, uh, which is of of which they are directly part of. At the same time, they understand larger issues. Yeah. Uh, okay. I think yes. there is no way to be away from it. Yeah. Yeah. And that is how they understand how to bring about peace. Without justice, you can't bring peace. There, there is no peace without justice. There is no peace without compassion and empathy, tolerance. So yes. uh, that is how we work in the school. Yeah. Thank you very much, Shushma. I think what is so interesting is how you use dialogue and discussion, how you encourage different action, how you engage the community. uh in different action that may um uh be in opposition to a mainstream policy uh this is um uh where action is so important as part of the night talam education as it is a life based education thank you very very much for that if there is anything further you want to add uh that we missed in your second round maybe you can put that into your concluding remark um uh at the end no. but i see no. yeah uh in in the concluding uh, yeah. remark in the uh, at towards the end of this program we'll come back to oh. you yeah, yeah.
I'm just thank you very much. Thank you. Ben. Yes. I, I just wanted to point out we only have about a half an hour left and there's already yep. uh, several questions that Catherine has right. emailed to you. Right. So right. Uh, perhaps we should just continue on rather than breaking for music. Uh, otherwise, oh, okay. I think we don't have enough time to to engage with the questions. Reva, do you want to just because um, uh, you've got the questions in front of you, do you want to start and raise the question? Sure. Um, I, I think one of the, the key questions that's come up in a couple of different ways um, is uh, it's specific to India in terms of thinking about um, how uh, uh, the how do you respond? I'm going to just rephrase it a little bit here, but how do you respond to the fact that um, policy that's coming from government may not actually be addressing uh, the kinds of, of constitutional values of, of secularism and socialism and, and uh, the principles that would support some of the kind of work towards nonviolence and instead is kind of pushing in a different direction. Um, so how, uh, and I think we can say the same in other contexts when you have government policy that is coming down that, that creates a different kind of an environment uh, around education, how do you push back against that? How do you use the kinds of ideas that you were all talking about to push back against um, the, uh, the, the, the kind of divisive policies that come out from government and how they become reflected in, um, in education? Um, in terms of answering that, uh, is there someone who would like to begin in answering that? Um, Beresab, does that, uh, being a policymaker, uh, would you like to take a stab at that question? You're muted. You're muted. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Surely, surely, surely. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, in fact, you know, again, it, uh, much trying to bring in education becomes difficult. I, uh, in the question, there are two parts. One is the contemporary situation of the government and therefore its impact on the people. And the second is how education can help in that. Hmm? Now, first part, I will first deal, then I'll come to the second part. The first part is there is a general hello. Yes, we heard sir. Continue. Yeah, we hear you. We hear you. Yeah, yeah. What? Yeah, yeah. You can hear me. Right. You can hear me. I can see you partly. Um, okay. Uh, so <clears throat> my understanding of the situation is that in the world all over. Uh, there is a kind of a backlash against liberal values. Authoritarian governments, majority governments are coming and are in a way directly or indirectly subverting the constitutions and much more the constitutional values that are imbibed, whether it is in US, whether it is India, whether it is Turkey, in many places. So, okay. Now, therefore, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I had actually started ended at the whole issue of social action. Now, therefore, what comes is, if there are activists who are already imbibed, who have received the kind of education we are talking about, there should be that kind of education. Those who can still understand and follow Gandhi, who are willing to undertake Satyagra. In the context of India, I would say, Supreme Court, which has been so far 
protecting the human rights, protecting the authority and tendencies of the executive government is now in league with them. Now I have been suggesting to my activist friends, will we do all that Gandhi did against the executive empire, also against the Supreme Court? Will we go and do Satyagraha against the Supreme Court, saying you are not performing the task the constitution has given to you? Uh, in a way, what is more important is, uh, you know, I, I'll please let me take back to all the statements I have made. Knowing learning values are meaningless unless you imbibe the values and you are willing to live for those values, work for those values. That's what Gandhi did. That's why Gandhi said, my life is my message. He didn't want to give other message. He said, my life is message. In a way, I'm saying the kind of value education we are all talking about and the way I was trying to hint, time is not good enough, uh, long enough for that purpose. Basically, I'm trying to say, currently the situation is that the authoritarian tendencies can only be fought by the methods Gandhiji talked about. And that has to be done in all these countries, A. And B, therefore, I'll sort of reassert the kind of education I was trying to recommend here very briefly, where it's not imbibing, not only learning, but imbibing, practicing, and trying to change the world, change the society towards that kind of order. So if I could just, for the sake of Sheikh Nanawi, um, translate uh, what Bersab meant when he said that uh, we need to follow Gandhian methods of Satyagraha. As you yourself said, uh, Nanawiji, um, uh, that the whole Satyagraha is internalizing the struggle. And in your own uh, uh, fight against external injustice to make sure you're uh, being as just as possible and uh, in that struggle against injustice around you. Um, do you, uh, Ninawiji, just to follow up before we get to Shushma, uh, do you see Bersab's suggestion of, uh, you know, using this uh, sort of uh, notion that Gandhi had of uh, a moral, Nonviolent strategy of resistance as being pertinent in your view uh, today? I, I uh, definitely believe that uh, uh, non action or pacifism is not an option at all. Uh, non violence does not mean not doing anything in the face of cruelty, injustice, and oppression. It's exactly the opposite. It's a call for action, not a call for inaction. And I believe that this call for action ought to be as nonviolent and as legal as possible. And then obviously a civic movement, NGOs and civic movement and, 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 and the rest of the civil society ought to actually be a participant in the lead for a, a true change, a, a real change in society. Uh, it definitely, it's a call to action. It's a call for struggle. It's a call. It's a call for nonviolent struggle, nonviolent proaction. It's not a call to sit still and wait out the consequences. Thank you very much, um, uh, Reva. Could you uh, move to the next question for Shushma Ji because? Um, I think she spoke a little bit about uh, the issues of policy. So I'd like her to be the first to address the next question that is relevant to her. Um, do, do you, are you wanting me to restate the question or do you want me to go move on to another question? Move, move on to another question. Yeah. Sure. Um, I think um, uh, there's a very important question for Sushma Ji. Um, Naitalim as has one of its pillars is lifelong learning, but how uh, does this relate to the pandemic of sexual violence? In other words, how uh, does the teaching in Naitalim uh, help to address this, this really global pandemic of sexual violence? 
violence against women in particular? So, as has been very clearly said by Beharji, unless any value is practiced, we are not in a position to change our, uh, actually our values and to enact on them. So, uh, in Naitani school, uh, we see certain kinds of productive work uh, are done by all, irrespective of gender and uh, irrespective of uh, caste for that matter. For example, a certain thing like cleanly work is something which is done by women in the family. At the same time, it is done by certain caste in the, uh, traditionally in Indian society. In Naitari school, this work is an essential component of learning whereby they do this work by scientific understanding at the same time understanding the social structure, how it functions and how do we change it by understanding it and by enacting it and by changing our own uh, uh, thoughts, our values and our actions. Similarly, cooking a self-reliance for self-reliance uh, we, are in, uh, we are dependent on each other, there is interdependency, but at the same time, we have to be self-designed in doing multiple things. Don't you think which in Indian families, particularly uh, uh, main folk, are not actually getting used to it because our families are extremely uh, uh, patriarchal. And uh, we in Naitali, uh, children learn how to how to understand their body, how to understand gender, and how to take responsibility in everyday life. So they cook, they understand the science behind it. At the same time, they understand the gender issue that exists as the structural part of their society. Uh, and again, it's not just that. They also understand what it is that this larger system enacting on their, their eating habits, uh, how they are driven by markets, by actually uh, uh, being promoted through advertisements to drink certain uh, drinks which are not good for them, which are actually, uh, uh, which take money from them, or siphon out money from them. At the same time, they, they underestimate the local beautiful, uh, the healthy drinks that they have, they have to understand the lemon they have, the other kind of uh, traditional uh, drinks they have. These are nutritionally good, but at the same time, if they drink Coca-Cola or other kind of car, what do they do? They are actually uh, hurting their own bodies, but at the same time, their actions are uh, are in the long run helping those who are actually trying to exploit So mm. that is the kind of understanding uh, that they get, that they have to, everything they consume, everything they use, every action they opt for, how it is affecting them, the others, uh, and the larger society, the structure at large. So these yeah. connections, making these connections and understanding holistically something which is extremely essential in my time. So it's not just cooking and trying to understand what it is to be equal uh, with their sisters and their mothers and their women in the family, but at the same time, how to be a responsible consumer, how to be self-reliant, how to understand green revolution, how to understand BT technologies, how to understand uh, these companies which produce pesticides and fertilizers, and how they affect biodiversity, food diversity, and nutrition and security of uh, their communities, the farmers, and, they, and the people of their country. But you can understand those simple things like the farming that they do, the cooking that is done in the kitchen, it 
can take you to this higher level of understanding with all its complexity. They can understand what in the Vandana Shiva is doing. They can understand what uh, other companies, global companies are uh, playing games uh, yes. with the farmer. Yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. You transported us to your classroom. And uh, I could visualize this discussion among the students that you were yes. that you were having yeah. with us. Thank you very much for that. Uh, before I turn to Reva, maybe one more question. Could we ask whether the panelists want to ask each other a question? Um, Shushma ji, Bersab ji, do do we have a question for Nanawi ji? Uh, that you would like to pose. It's such a it's such a honor to have him with us. Do we have a question for yeah. him? Or Nanawi Ji, do you have a question for Bersab or Shushma Ji? We give you just two minutes to formulate a question. Otherwise we'll go back to the uh, shall I ask one? Please, please. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I personally uh, feel that in India, the kind of communal uh, society that are being today is something which is extremely uh, uh, serious matter. And uh, I'm sure he must be observing this. Uh, at the same time, I think that uh, every religion has to be uh, a very dynamic uh, uh, in its nature. And it has to, people in that religion have to introspect uh, themselves and to see that uh, the values of equality, justice, and non violence, uh, they are honored. And there might not be practices which adhere to these values. How does he look at this issue in Islam? And how does he feel that he needs to be? Uh, uh, Nanawi, Nanawi Ji, did you get that? Um, I, I, I really sorry. It was very difficult for me. I think the voice was a bit distant, okay. so it was very difficult for me to understand and grasp the, the question. If you could summarize yeah. it, or, or... Uh, Barisab, okay. do you want to summarize it, or else? Oh. Yeah. In, in fact, I was not so, so clear. I was going to ask a question okay. after Sheikh Shahab. And, and no. maybe uh, if it is a repetition, then he will say it is roughly the same thing. Uh, basically, I was uh, going to ask Sheikh Shahab, uh, within any religion and in Islam, surely there are shades of opinion. There are different kinds of interpretations given. Uh, what we normally call there are liberals, there are moderates and things like that. So how do you see the situation internationally and how within the religion, the right, what you have been in a way propagating, what the right interpretation, the right understanding of education of, of the religion is more widespread than currently what can it done how education can help in that uh, islamist education as well as the general education i don't yes. know uh, can you yeah. paraphrase shushma's uh, yeah I, I, so I think i think you heard bear sobs uh, what shushma as far as i understand was trying to say is that there's a lot of communal tension communal problems in india today but how do you face those communal issues? You know, the the uh, particularly between Hindus and and uh, Muslims, for instance. Uh, how do you face that without getting into identity and polarized uh, debates where um, you do no longer honor sort of nonviolence and and uh, a more holistic view? Yeah. So this is, I think, what she was trying to say. So maybe you could address. Uh, I would like to add. Uh, yes, Shushma. Yes, uh, yes, Shushma. At the same time, there is a process of 
are reformed in every religion. Like religion is changing over a period of time. The practices, the way uh, the things are actually uh, explained by people who lead the religion. So, uh, uh, there are things which uh, need to change with time towards justice, equality, gender equality. And uh, how does he look at it? <laughs> does he find any need to uh, change uh, a, a, a situation in Indian context, in Islamic culture as well? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, I think I, I think uh, Sheikh Nanawi, you have quite a lot to work with there. So why don't you go uh, ahead and uh, try I'm to? I'm just wanting to know about the orthodoxy. If it's yeah. there, Shishmaji, can we, we Shishmaji, on, can, let, uh, can we let Sheikh Nanawi uh, respond because we're running out of time now? Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Um, all right. I think I gather some of the uh, some of the issues here. I'm not. I've been to India many times, uh, fortunately, and uh, I'm very well uh, aware of some of the uh, uh, Muslim Sufi history in India, such as in Ajmer, uh, um, uh, Aja Chisti, uh, Saab, the, one of the uh, Muslim figures of India for the past 700 years, in a sense, as, as his shrine stands, it, sh it struck me as uh, the call for love towards all, malice towards none, was central in the theme there, and that was there for a while. There is always an issue of uh, a, a sophisticated argument when it comes to discussing religion, identity, and violence in general. Uh, uh, on one hand, people of faith are far too eager to distance themselves from extremists in their community, often uh, denying that religious violence has any religious motivation whatsoever. And this is uh, true also for Muslims who often uh, glibly dismiss those who commit acts of terror in the name of Islam as not really Muslim, uh, right? There's, there's that. On the other side, uh, critics of uh, one faith or faith systems, religiosity as a whole, tend to exhibit an inability to understand religion outside of its absolutist connotations. They scour scripture for bits of savagery or point of, of perceived savagery or points of extreme examples of perceived religious bigotry uh, where there is uh, uh, plenty uh, to, to look for and, uh, and, uh, and to single out. Uh, it doesn't really take uh, a lot of research uh, to do something like that. And I always say a text out of context is a pretext. The abiding nature of scripture, whether it is the uh, Bible of, uh, or the Torah of Moses, the Bible of Jesus, or the Quran of Muhammad, or others, other prophets, rests not only in their truth claims, but also it does in their malleability, the ability to be modeled and shaped into uh, a dynamic form of uh, the requirement of the worshiper. For example, the same Bible that commands Jews to quote, as in Leviticus 19.18, love your neighbor as yourself, also exhorts them to quote, kill every man, woman, child, infant, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey who worships other than God, as in 1 Samuel 15.3. The same Jesus who told his disciples to turn the other cheek, to the, other, the other cheek, as in Matthew 5.39, uh, uh, also, uh, told them, quote, uh, as in Matthew 10, 34, I did not come to bring peace, but the sword. The same Quran as well, that told them, as in 532, that killing one human soul uh, or next is person is as if you killed the entire humanity. Also tells them in another verse, slay the idolaters wherever you find them. So, how a worshiper treats these superficially conflicting commandments. They're not really conflicting because if you take them out of context, then it's a pretext. But how do you take texts? Depends on the believer. If you're a violent misogynist, you will find plenty in whatever faith system you want to justify whatever you want to say. 
And if you're a peaceful, nonviolent, democratic feminist, you will also find justification in the scripture for your point of view. So uh, what, what that means is simplistic knee-jerk response uh, is not always uh, necessarily the right thing. And we all know when it comes to uh, identity, uh, the issue of religion uh, is really more of an issue, a lot of times our issue of an identity. When people say, I'm a Hindu, I'm a Jew, I'm a Christian, uh, I am a Muslim, uh, there is a lot more identity than actual theology per se, or religiosity per se, uh, because religion does not exist in a vacuum. Uh, uh, as a form of identity, religion is inextricable from all other factors that make up a person's self-understanding, like culture, ethnicity, nationality, gender, sexual orientation, and et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, what a member of a suburban megachurch in my home state in, in Georgia calls Christianity may be radically different from what an impoverished a farmer, Christian farmer in the hills of some uh, uh, Christian uh, uh, churches in India calls Christianity, et cetera, et cetera. I, I don't think I can take a lot of time. Sorry, Ron. Uh, good, good. Um, is there uh, uh, any other questions maybe for Bear Saab, Nanawiji, if you have a question for Bear Saab or Shushmaji? We have about seven minutes remaining. So we we'll just, uh, uh, if there's any questions from your side, Bersab, you need to unmute. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I have unmuted. I'm not asking a question now. I'm waiting for, as you said, concluding remarks or whatever question are there. Yeah, all right, all right, good, good. You. Um, Nanawiji, I have some questions you... of Sushma, but I, I'll deal with that later. <laughs> yeah, you're in India, so that's easy. Um, okay, Nanawiji, do you have any questions for the other uh, uh, participants at this point? No, just love. No. Just love, well, <laughs> that's, <Yeah>. that's wonderful. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> we reciprocate doubly, partly. Then I think if Reva is uh, not pushing for any more questions, we should go to our concluding remarks. Yeah. And uh, I think we'll say, um, Shushma, would you like to begin on the concluding remark from this panel? You have about three, two minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, that uh, at this point, uh, we are in a situation where all of us should think that we are the people on this earth. We are the people of this earth and all of us need to survive, to relate to each other, to relate to life form of this nature. Also, the non-living entities with a kind of sensitivity so that we, as we survive, and maybe with love, with patience, with appreciation for the, uh, for the differences that we are in, but at the same time with the appreciation that we are with a great sense of togetherness, a great sense of being one, uh, we should be able, able to overcome the crisis that we are in, the environmental crisis, the resource crisis, the relationship, exploitative relationship that we are in. We need to change this, and maybe we need to have an education which enables our children, the youth group, and people at large to change the situation. Thank you. I, I am very thankful that I got the chance to interact, uh, though I, I had very uh, poor connection. But yes, thank you for that. Um, thank you on two counts, uh, Sh Shushmaji. One count was how you brought forward interconnectedness uh, throughout, and I hope 
we can find ways to keep this interconnection going between us so that we can build a much greater uh, 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 a joint uh, a vision for interconnectedness in future. But the second point is to thank you for putting up with all of these technologies, uh, these hassles, and uh, for sticking with us. This really is the resilience uh, that we uh, need to honor. Thank you very much for that. Uh, can we now go to Sheikh Nanawiji for your final concluding remark uh, from this session? Yes, I really believe that it's incumbent upon all those who can uh, to make nonviolence and peace, two tracks, a clear, luminous, and dynamic force in our very polarized world of ours, rooted in a principled determination to transcend selfishness. Nonviolence can break down political, dogmatic, and ideological, and even religious boundaries. Born out of our deep interdependence, peace and nonviolence are essential to human relationships and to a fulfilled humanity that we all seek hope, growth, and opportunity for all. They are the path to enlightenment. They are the beginning of the path. There is no going to mindfulness. There is no going to meditation. There is no going to enlightenment except through peace and nonviolence, nonviolence and peace, whichever order you like. They are indispensable to the creation of a just economy, a just world, and a global and a peaceful global community. So we have a job to brighten our world in so many ways. And we are a day short, a day late and a dime, and a dime short. Thank you for bringing us so much light to this conversation. Thank you for the light that you brought. It's uh, been really enlightening. Uh, Beresab, do you want to just give the final word in today's webinar? Yeah. Um, peace based, I would say value-based peace education and the whole cluster of education is extremely critical and important for changing the world. A, B, the contemporary education paradigm cannot take into account this and cannot be a good vehicle. Third, alternatives can be thought of which are based on this, uh, where it is porous between the community, life, individual life and the education. So from formal, it has to be a more flexible education, bringing a porous relationship between community and this, and where instead of knowledge, love, compassion, these values are more important, knowledge becomes secondary. I think that kind of education can, otherwise the kind of peace education we are all talking about has to be much more informal than in the formal institution. It can be a force fit, which will not really yield results. Therefore, let us look for those alternatives and how we move from this, this cannot be just closed, how we move from this to the alternative paradigm. That's all. Where True we action. make activists. Where we make True activists. action. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Beresab. This is uh, ending with action and ending with changing the paradigm. I hope that we can all meet again. Before I conclude, I wanted to uh, say that we will be having our next webinar on December 13th, which is at the same time, it'll be the critical voices for justice through peace. I hope uh, you will attend and participate as some of those people have participated in, in this uh, webinar. Uh, I also want to say that you'll probably all be contacted to get podcasts because you're all brilliant uh, in your presentations and we're making peace podcasts. You can, speaking your peace, you can find online for 26 podcasts that have been made. I hope Nanawiji, you could bring that into your uh, training and education, Bersab and Shushmaji, that you'll also 
uh, listen to those podcasts. I want to thank our uh, uh, particular Reva Joshi uh, for helping to organize this with her group of two dozen colleagues and associates, uh, this series and this particular webinar. I want to thank uh, Ria for helping, but particularly Jan Majay for all uh, the technical work, which had a few uh, difficulties. And I want to thank the audience uh, for sticking with us with great questions, with uh, interest, and I hope that uh, you'll take some of the key um, uh, key learnings from this webinar, which were so rich uh, into action and into your life. And uh, again, thank the speakers. Uh, let us keep in touch. I think this is the beginning of our connectedness. And I don't think we're, Jai Jagat is going to let any one of you go. So I hope we'll meet soon and continue this important dialogue and program of action. Thank you very much and Jai Jagat. Jai Jagat. Jai Jagat. I just, Jai Jagat. Uh, thanks to all of you. Oh. Sorry, yeah. if I could just correct one yeah, thing. Still, the podcast is called Speaking Our Peace. Ah, yes. Uh, Speaking so our I, I encourage all of you. There are, are today the eighth episode is being dropped. We have 26 uh, in uh, in the works, and we would love to use the audio from this session today to create a podcast. So I'm hoping that all of the panelists are are, are okay with that. Um, thank sure. you so very much and thank you Jill for taking on this this role. So Jai Jagat everyone. Jai yeah, Jagat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jai Jagat. Jai Jagat. Thank you. Sure. Uh, all right. One final song. Uh, Ria do you want to play that? Sure I can play it. Yeah. Sure. Jai Jagat song. Okay, Yeah, we're just starting that one minute. Everybody seems to be leaving. Uh, really need to share audio. Ah, uh -huh, Uh, Ria, there is no audio. Can you please share audio? Yeah, that's right. Quite right. We we can't hear. Uh, let me play it back. No problem. Sorry, Janmaja, what? Yes. Yeah. Thank you.
वार जा सिरब मन पे वार जा सब के हित के वास्ते अपना सुख विसार जा सब के हित के वास्ते अपना सुख विसार जा जय जगत जय जगत जय जगत पुकार जा जय जगत जय जगत जय जगत पुकार जा के वास्ते अपना सुख विसार जा Thank you. I hope you liked it. Thank you so much, Janma Jai Jai Jagat to everyone. Jai Jagat everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs>